Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm in New York City where it's snowing and I am so delighted to see all of you. So let's get to um, the content of the day today. Um, I am delighted to invite Alan Jenkins back to really take us through um, a journey of how we measure the impact of our culture change, communications and storytelling approaches and strategies. You know, this whole question of evaluation and monitoring is one that many of us in the social justice world um, explore and are often challenged by because measuring this work doesn't lend itself as easily as perhaps uh, more quantitative outcomes like health outcomes. And still it's really important for us to have ways to explore whether what we're doing is effective, whether we're having the impact that we desire, what kinds of indicators we might create. So I'm really delighted that Alan Jenkins um, has joined us again. And it's because Alan straddles so many of the worlds that we are straddling. So he's currently a professor of practice at Harvard Law School where he teaches communications. He also was at the Ford Foundation. So he sat in the place of philanthropy. He was the founder and the executive director of the, of the Opportunity Agenda. And so has created a lot of campaigns, communications, message boards. And he's an artist and storyteller himself. So. It's pretty amazing to have somebody like Alan who straddles and brings together all of these intersecting worlds to lead us through this journey of discovering how we might get better at really understanding whether what we're doing is working, not working, and how we might be more effective in our work. I wanna also take a moment to welcome Kathy and all the other folks from Ford who are joining us um, today. This community is an extraordinary community, uh, really uh, an absolutely extraordinary community of leaders around the world. And uh, Kathy is the director of the BUILD program. And so I just wanna say, hey, hello, thank you for joining us today. Um, and thank you for, to the Ford Foundation for making this community possible. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Alan Jenkins. Great, thanks so much, Malika, and hello to everyone. Uh, as Malika mentioned, I've been on multiple sides of this question of evaluating narrative change and uh, communications and cultural strategies generally, uh, both as a funder receiving reports and the like, as a, 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 an NGO uh, president uh, having to both assess our own work and report it to others. Uh, I've also been on the boards of media, uh, nonprofit media companies that were, you know, trying to look at metrics and the impact that they were having. So uh, this is a, a challenging issue, but the good news is there are lots of solutions and best practices out there. And so I'm going to present some ideas to you, but I'm really hoping that this will be a conversation and also that we'll have time to do a small group so that you all can do some specific problem solving for your own situations and country contexts and uh, issues that you're working on. So I want to, us to jump straight in uh, by asking you, some of you, to share uh, one communication evaluation challenge or issue that you're struggling with when it comes to narrative change, the subject of today's session. Um, I just want to hear from you, uh, some of you, some of what you're struggling with so we can make sure that our time together is responsive to your needs. So great. Uh, Eve. Yeah, I figured I'd jump in. Um, I'm Eve Takman Giola, Director of Communications for the Economic Policy Institute. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we had a good year from a communications perspective, but one thing we're looking at going forward is reaching two new key, well, audiences that we have reached, but want to reach more, a younger audience, and also what I'm calling the swayables. Mm -hmm. So folks that uh, may have, you know, not the workers that aren't on unions or disillusioned with unions and progressive economics. So how do we get those swayables? And 
it's one of the challenges and things we're looking at that we're going to do but you know any advice you could give would be much appreciated great thank you even thanks for starting us off and i i'm gonna um tweak your question for our purposes which is how do we assess right whether we're actually reaching those audiences that we want to uh reach how do we measure that? How do you engage in mid-course correction, right? So, um, but I'm happy to talk to you more offline about your core question. And I know my former organization, Opportunity Agenda, is working with uh, with your organization now. So, uh, okay, let's hear from a couple more folks. Uh, narrative change evaluation questions, challenges that you all are dealing with. Some of you got up early in the morning or stayed up late at night uh for this session so i'm sure there's some specifics that you're you're looking to solve so i am leila nashawati and i work with uh, the association for progressive communications mm. so uh this year has been uh, quite intense uh we have been working online for decades um for tw for 20 years now but uh, now there are more and more people online and we work uh, supporting human rights organizations and people who work online, who are trying to shift online. So um, we are thinking on how to strategically address this. And we are also going through some internal uh, uh, um, changes where we are trying to be more active as uh, like the communications team to be more strategically focused, to be uh, less of like responding to needs and more uh, proactive in identifying audiences, but I actually find it difficult to actually uh, segment audiences. I think we all talk about uh, dividing audiences, but at the end of the day, it's difficult to actually plan who are you targeting and how. So I'm really interested to know how to assess this and whether we're doing things the right way. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's hear one more. Somewhere Alan, else. there's a comment in the chat that says uh, from who is Cecile that says knowing what data to collect and setting up the proper collection system. Ah, excellent, excellent. Okay, good, good. Okay, well, let me um, jump in. I'm going to share my screen and share some ideas and best practices with you that are going to be responsive to some of what you all have raised, but not all. And then we'll jump out and uh, discuss. So this question of why measure uh, narrative change, uh, the, it's, I do think it's important, and this is reflected a bit in the questions that some of you asked or the challenges that some of you identified. There are a few different reasons, right? One is internal learning and improvement and internal accountability, right? To, are we making a difference in the world? Are we doing what we said we were gonna do? And is that thing that we said we were gonna do, if we're doing it, is that making the change that we wanna see? Uh, both change in the uh, narrative of the audience that we're targeting, and also is that narrative change actually improving people's lives because that's what uh, all of us are, are in this business to do. Um, a, a different but related challenge is accountability to stakeholders. You know, Funders obviously uh, loom large in that respect. Um, but also inspiration for supporters. And so here, and this goes to uh, the question that was asked uh, about data collection, right? The, we're, we're often gonna be collecting data through a, a variety of means, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment uh, for all purposes, but then we need to be sharing that data and analyzing that data for diff the different purposes that we're using it for, right? So what we generate internally for our own learning may or may not make sense to external stakeholders. If we simply give them, you know, raw, you know, uh, you know, internet usage data or uh, public opinion data or what have you, it's not necessarily going to make sense to them or tell the story that we want to tell. Whereas internally, we want to be developing a culture of, of learning so that we're constantly looking at that data. And with external stakeholders, and to some extent internal, we also want to inspire, right? We want to tell the story of why our work matters. And so it's important to separate out those functions a bit, right? We don't want to be mixing uh, you know, uh, public relations communications with evaluation 
uh, uh, data. We want to make sure that our evaluation uh, is as uh, objective as possible, that when something goes wrong or is not working, we're able to acknowledge that, recognize it, and make changes based on that, and that that's going to be different from the stories that we may pluck out to, uh, to reach you know, and inspire external audiences. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that distinction and, and what it means. So this idea of learning improvement and internal accountability is crucial. I, you know, in the best case scenario, we all wanna be learning organizations, right? Where we're constantly assessing what are we learning out in the field? What's working along all of the activities that we use, right? Whether it's organizing or litigation or research, um, and narrative change strategies should fall within that, right? What are we learning? Let's share that across our staff uh, and our um, internal you know, consultants and others. And let's be constantly asking the question, how can we be more impactful? Do we need to make changes? Are there things that are not working? Are there things that are working even better than we expected that we need to double down on and really emphasize? that internal uh, structure. And that you know, requires setting aside time and resources and people to collect and report data. Uh, you know, even for our own staff, it's often the case that just reporting raw data is not gonna be useful to staff. So that um, requires its own functions. Um, and you know, here are two quick examples, and I, I apologize that most of my examples are U.S.-based because that's those are the case studies that I have access to. But I, I've tried along the way to incorporate uh, some examples from other countries as well. Um, but two quick examples of this internal learning: one comes from the the U.S. movement to uh, abolish the death penalty, where anti-death penalty opponents had hit a wall. They were not making any progress in uh, reducing U.S. support for the death penalty among uh, you know, U.S. Uh, residents nor amongst lawmakers. And they had been using the story of abolition that, uh, as, as I believe and many people believe, the death penalty is always wrong, it's immoral, uh, it's a human rights violation and should never be used. It, that convinced a, a, a certain block of people, of voters in this instance, but was not reaching other large numbers. What their research and assessment showed was both that that message wasn't working for a lot of their audiences, and that adding to that a message about uh, exoneration, right? The idea that the death penalty, whether you, you know, think it's a good or bad idea, it's rife with mistakes. And so the likelihood that someone who is innocent of the crime they've been convicted of will be executed is high. And they found that that gave them access to large numbers of new audiences who were not willing to listen to the abolition argument, but were willing to listen to the exoneration argument. And that that reduced their support for the death penalty in all instances. And at that point, they began to make significant progress. Uh, still a battle to be fought, to be sure, but a lot of the progress of the last two decades has been uh, layering on that uh, exoneration narrative. Uh, another you know, well-known example comes from the marriage equality movement here in the United States, uh, where the, what the data, evaluation data was showing the movement was that arguing that uh, gay and lesbian uh, couples should be able to marry uh, because it would give them access to the kind of rights and responsibilities and benefits of marriage uh, was not working. It wasn't convincing large numbers of people uh, who, you know, uh, straight people who said in surveys, oh, uh, you know, straight people get married for love, gay people get married for rights and benefits. So the movement shifted their, in response to their evaluation data, they shifted their narrative to one of love and inclusion, belonging and family. Uh, and we know that that turned out to be very, very successful, not only in convincing the US Supreme Court, but in moving hearts, minds and policy around the, the country in ways that we'll look at. So I wanted to give you two concrete examples of using evaluation and assessment data for the learning process. 
those of you who uh, were part of my earlier presentation saw this idea of movement, uh, building a movement narrative, uh, which includes beginning with the voices and insights and values of people directly affected and of advocates, but then informed by research, that orange box. Uh, and the, that's where the data and assessment and evaluation come in. And then, you know, keep going around the circle to implementation, experience, and evaluation, right? So once you're actually trying out strategies, you're constantly asking, is it working and how is it working? Uh, and then adapting, right? That's why it's a circle, because you're constantly having to adapt. And when big events happen, uh, you know, such as the pandemic, you need to kind of reassess and make sure that your uh, narrative strategies are still working or don't need to change, or that, that more could be done. Uh, then there's accountability to external uh, folks and, uh, and inspiration for supporters. And so that often comes in the form of an annual report, which you see an example of uh, here uh, from, um, I believe this is United We Dream, uh, but also making sure you have the kind of anecdotal stories of, you know, here's the op-ed that we placed. Here's the, um, these are on the left of your screen. Uh, here is the media appearance that our executive director did uh, that reached uh, millions of people. Here is the person who was exonerated and who helped to tell the story uh, of why the death penalty is always wrong. But also here's the data. Uh, you see on your on the right, right? And so uh, you're using the same sources of information that we'll discuss, but you're telling your story in different ways, always accurate, always in al aligned with the facts, but recognizing that different audiences are gonna receive the same information differently. Uh, and so this goes to this idea of both quantitative and qualitative information, right? So you both wanna be collecting hard data uh, you know, this is an example from the Innocence Project of how many people were exonerated, how many people did we exonerate, um, but also interviews and focus groups and the like. Um, at the front end of that is should always be planning. In other words, your evaluation system, your narrative evaluation tools should always be built in at the earliest possible moment, even though you might have to change them over time, right? So that means discussing with your staff and leadership and partners, what's your theory of narrative change? So in other words, if we change perceptions of this group uh, with this audience, then we will see better treatment or a change in policies or an upholding of human rights uh, or a better equipping of, uh, you know, of advocates uh, to be successful. So articulating that is important. Uh, many of you know the concept of SMART planning. So the English acronym uh, SMART is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound, right? So going from your big goal of we want to end all child uh, poverty to a goal that is specific and can be measured. That applies to all of your work, but it also should apply to your narrative change goals. And we'll, I'll show you an example of that. So here's how the SMART um, goals typically work in, in practice. Uh, you know, you might have a broad goal of save the children, you know, a, a, end foodborne illness. Uh, but you see that SMART goals are things like pass legislation this year, right, time bound and specific to ensure that every child in the state has access to quality health care. So you'll know in a year whether you achieved that goal or not, or the, the progress that you made towards it, right? That's the idea of a SMART goal, going from, from something that can feel very general to something that is actually measurable. So in the, in the communications context, uh, it might look like this, right? For mass, if, if, you know, if your goal is end mass incarceration, your a narrative goal might be increase public support for alternatives to incarceration by 20%, among millennial voters in two years, right, as measured by public opinion polls. So let's break that down, right? You've picked a metric. That's not the only way to measure narrative change. There are other examples below, uh, but it's one example um, and it's specific. It's, it is time bound, meaning that it's uh, in, in two years. And in this instance, this is something I recommend, actually indicate how you're going to measure it, right? So 
maybe you have the resources to do a public opinion poll, or maybe there are enough poll, polls being done by journalist organizations and others so that you can assess it. Maybe you need to pick another indicator, right? Um, and I'll just give you a, a moment to uh, look at some of these other examples. Okay, so um, you, you get the point. I think um, this goes to a couple of your questions about how do you go from, you know, we want to reach youth to, uh, you know, much more specific measurable goals. Now, you know, let's just return to mass incarceration. This might be one of six or seven or more uh, narrative change smart goals that you have for the year or the two year period. Uh, but the more specific you can be about them and about the audience, right here, it's millennial voters, the more measurable it's going to be. Uh, and, you know, that that realistic part is important, right? You don't want to you, you want to reach, right? You want to be ambitious, but you also don't want to set a goal that is completely unattainable that will just end up being demoralizing, right? Uh, so, uh, th and that sometimes requires estimation, you may not know at the beginning of a campaign what's what's possible. The US marriage equality folks uh, were, uh, they, they shot low, actually. They had a, a 20 year timeline and it, it only took them 11 years to get everything that they were trying to get. Okay, this is really important. Uh, th this is, in my view, uh, kind of the best uh, analysis of the categories of narrative change metrics that, that you should be thinking about, right? Activity metrics, that means, did we do what we said we were gonna do, right? If we said we were gonna have 10, 10 press conferences, did we have 10 press conferences? And if we didn't, then what was the reason that we didn't? Did, you know, was it lack of resources? Was it changed circumstances, et cetera, right? Or, you know, it could be social media posts, it could be rallies, it could be, you know, poems, uh, you know, wide range of, of activities. Reach metrics are, uh, you know, both, did we reach the audience we were targeting, millennial voters, for example, in a particular jurisdiction, and um, what was the size of that audience, right? So if we know, you know, in the United States, there are, or, you know, we can pick a, another country, uh, you know, there are, you know, 25 million uh, voters who are millennials, uh, and you know we're seeking to reach them. Our reach me metrics tell us in part how many of those folks did we reach, and I'll be talking about some ways of assessing that. Next is engagement metrics, right? Measuring when and how others interact with our communications campaigns and narrative change campaigns. That, of course, is easiest in the social media context. Uh, because you can look at likes and, uh, you know, shares and all of that. Uh, but, you know, we also know if you, uh, you know, have a, a rally or you speak to a congre religious congregation or what have you, and you're, you know, doing petition signing afterwards, for example, you get, you can uh, figure out the extent to which people engaged with your content, with your message, right? And then finally is impact metrics measuring the changes you've, you've achieved, both in attitudes and behaviors and in uh, people's lives. That, of course, is the hardest to measure for reasons that we'll talk about, but there are ways to do that. Okay, so some of the tools that we use. Um, and so this goes to uh, one of the questions that was asked, right? One is having a, a regular process for downloading with staff, right? Oh, I spoke to this group, uh, you know, this religious, uh, uh, you know, faith congregation, and they loved it when I talked about, you know, the narrative of welcoming the stranger in uh, the, uh, in the Bible in the Old Testament. Uh, but then when I spoke to this other congregation, they rejected it because it didn't really fit with their faith stories. And actually the golden rule, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you was much more powerful. Just literally collecting that information and having uh, you know, it could be just an, an Excel sheet, right, that uh, you use to as a database to keep that kind of information. Uh, and also uh, think about activities, right? Every time when I was running the opportunity agenda, every time one of our staff did a presentation uh, like this one, we would 
uh, you know, collect the numbers on it, you know, who participated and from what organization and all of that. And we kept that in a database for our own purposes and also to report to our stakeholders. Uh, social media and online data tracking obviously is crucial. Uh, there are you know, free tools for doing that, but also expensive tools for doing that. Um, content analysis, right? What this means is, all right, if our group, uh, you know, if we're working on behalf of uh, Dalits or Roma or, uh, you know, indigenous peoples, uh, how are they depicted in news stories now? How are they gonna be depicted, you know, how are they depicted six months later? and you know, two years later. And that requires some level of expertise to walk through and see how, uh, what language was used, what were the depictions, were they positive or negative, were they all about crime and poverty or were they also about investment and thriving communities? Um, but that can be very important and it can be done with policy, with cultural discourse. The Opportunity Agenda has done reports on uh, entertainment media depictions of immigrants, for example. Uh, so that is um, both quantitative and qualitative. How much coverage was there? And you know, was it helpful or harmful in terms of our narrative? Surveys and focus groups are uh, an important tool, but they also can be costly. Uh, and so uh, you know, one thing, as I noted, is to see if you have a, a topic that's hot, and where polling is being done in your region, then you wanna be monitoring that to see if there's attitude change. Uh, interviews, ethnography, right? Actually speaking to people about, yeah, you know, after this big story came out, I, you know, people started asking me about my experiences and whether I was experiencing discrimination as an example. Legal and policy tracking, right? Did the laws that we, we were seeking to change change? Um, and then this idea of integrated evaluations and case studies. When you have the resources, and this is something that you know you should lean on your funders to to uh, resource. If they're funding the project, uh, that you know you should also be asking them to fund some resources for evaluation to actually assess at least at the middle and, and the end, uh, whether you know to interview people, but also to look at data to shorthand that. Um, okay, so these are just some examples. Um, at, here are activity, uh, an example of activity metrics from Center for Community Change. These were publicly available on the, on the web, which is why I'm using them. But full disclosure, I used to be a board member uh, at Community Change. Um, so you just you see they're, they're setting out the number of partner convenings that they did, right? That's one way, one of their strategies for doing multiple things, including narrative change. Here's some examples of, of reach metrics. Uh, so this is from the, on the left, from the Innocence Project, uh, number of visits to their website, uh, stories in popular media outlets. I would also wanna know, well, what was the circulation of those media outlets? And so on the right, you see that some of that data is available. So this, uh, the top, your top right image uh, is regarding, um, uh, news outlets, newspaper outlets in India. Uh, so this is publicly available. I found this through a Google search uh, and more of that data is available, but you can also purchase more detailed data if you have the resources. Um, on the bottom right is uh, data again from the, uh, from the web, uh, most popular social networks among fixed internet users in Mexico, right? By age group. So uh, that's, you know, outside data that you can use to help analyze your own, uh, your own data. Engagement metrics. This is uh, an example, uh, public report by, the, uh, by participant media. So they're actually looking at if you saw one of their films, so they, they make films and, and uh, television, uh, they're monitoring based on your social media content, um, what you did after seeing uh, one of their films. And then they're comparing that to people who didn't uh, experience their content, right? And so they've really broken it down very specifically, information seeking, uh, information sharing, taking individual action, encouraging community action, right? So they can report uh, with a lot of specificity some of the things that were done by people who saw their films that were not done by people who did not see their films. 
Uh, this can also be affordable, just a note. So this is uh, uh, Google Trends, which is you know free uh, resource. And so uh, I did a search of the phrase defund the police, uh, which in the United States was, uh, you know, has been very much in play uh, starting from uh, the uh, summer, uh, essentially when the killing of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and others occurred. And so you see that that phrase was not used at all uh, or not searched for at all, pardon me, uh, in Google. Uh, until uh, ab about Memorial Day, uh, the end of May in the United States. And then suddenly there was this jump and it's, it's come down over time, right? So these, this is a free tool for assessing the extent to which in this instance, a phrase that was not really used before your move, this movement uh, really took off uh, and then was used and we can track over time the extent to which it's in the public discourse. Uh, and again, that's free. Okay, uh, and impact metrics, which are, uh, you know, in many ways, the most challenging, uh, because it's so hard to prove causation, right? If you've got multiple, you know, things going on, um, you know, television shows and public discourse, and maybe public events are happening, um, you know, it, it can be very difficult to determine whether, but for your activities, uh, the discourse would have changed. But we do have here you know, perhaps a, a remarkable example from uh, the marriage equality movement, uh, which it shows the change in public attitudes towards marriage equality over a period of looks like 15, about 15 years. Uh, so, you know, can the marriage equality movement say that writ large, they were responsible for that change? Uh, you know, you, you might not perhaps be able to prove it, uh, you know, scientifically, but I, I think you know the kind of mixed methodologies of interviews and tracking data and seeing the extent to which uh, shifts in narrative strategy led to shifts in, in attitudes. I think a very strong case can be made. Um, you know, on the right, you have a, a couple of other uh, examples. Uh, so the upper right is again the Innocence Project. So. Um, this is uh, uh, an example of, of laws that were passed, uh, but also of a human example, right, of someone who benefited from them. Uh, on the bottom right was a campaign, uh, long story, but uh, the Hallmark Network in, in the US uh, refused to run an ad featuring uh, a queer couple and uh, pressure was brought to bear on them, communications pressure, and they made a change. Uh, and so the organization GLAD was one of the organizations that uh, pushed that. So that's an impact metric, right? Again, hard to uh, prove causation, but I think uh, you know important nonetheless in telling the story. So before I get to challenges, um, why don't I jump out and let's uh, take questions and comments and make sure that we uh, get to actually talk about the things that are on your minds. My name's Jenny. I'm from also like Layla from the Association for Progressive Communications. Mm -hmm. And I guess my, um, I was wondering if you could comment a bit about um, something that I'm curious about, which is the more intimate personal data um, that would come out of an evaluation around communication. So for example, uh, we work a lot in collaboration and in partnership. So um, through our communications, we often um, deepen relationships with our existing partners, or we find new partners through what we, what we communicate out about. Mm. Um, and core to our work really is movement building. So I'm just wondering if you've got any comments about um, that in relation to measuring communication change. I suppose it's a kind of advocacy question that's built into um, what I'm asking about. So, I, so I, I, yeah, I'm not sure I completely understand your question. So there kind of, you talked about intimate, more intimate details that come out of the effort and about movement building, but what, can you clarify for me what your question is? It's about re relations, about relationships that can uh, arise out of or deepen in terms uh -huh. of what one is communicating. Got um, it. And, and for us, the core of it is, uh, core of our work is movement building. Uh, 
bringing partnerships um, cross uh, issue partnerships. So yeah, that's got it. So I can tell you, you know, in, in my former organization, uh, we would both we kept track of all of our partnerships. Here's everyone we engaged with and in what way, right? Here are the people who are you know, on our email list who have actually asked for things. Here are the people we've uh, you know, convened with at uh, meetings and the like. And we actually had a, a three-tiered system of uh, you know, close partners, um, you know, uh, allies who are occasionally engaged, and then people who simply you know, received our information. And then we would also capture and ask about, we did an annual online survey of everybody in our database uh, to ask them about any kind, you know, there were open-ended questions about any benefits, did they use our materials and the like. But from that, we would get stories. Oh, you know, at your convening, we met this other group and then we collaborated on something else, right? And so we would capture all of that. That part was, was qualitative. In other words, we didn't know what percentage of our, uh, you know, our, our partners had had some kind of epiphany like that, but we would capture those stories. And then sometimes we would ask them, can we interview you to talk about why that was, what happened, you know, where it went from there, all of that. I hope that's helpful. Um, Jennifer uh, Morales also has a hand up. So I guess I would like, since you have been in the philanthropic world, maybe to give some reassurance that sometimes our measures seem so amorphous mm -hmm. and hard to hold on to. So something like trying to change how people talk about a certain thing, um, you know, maybe there's polling, maybe there isn't. Our funders, what kind of data is of strong interest to funders? Like what feels like proof, I guess I'm asking yeah. that their money, um, their investment in us made good change for people? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, you know, I, I can't be, I, I can't be fully, um, uh, I, you know, my answer will not make you uh, completely happy, but I, you know, I think that, that number one, that breakdown of activity, reach, engagement, and impact helps a lot with funders. It gives them you know, assurance that, okay, you're looking at this in an analytical way. You're not just throwing out stuff to see what's going to stick. And in my experience, if you can pick a few, uh, you know, I'll call them metrics, but you know, a, a few measures that you think are you know, realistic and that you know, are, are good assessments of the progress you're making, it doesn't have to be a, you know, an ironclad peer-reviewed study in order to uh, make the point with your funders. Uh, you know, I think you could, for example, pick three places where you're, what, uh, Jennifer, what, tell me just a sentence about the work that, that you're, you're doing or give, give me an um, example. Of what yeah, I'm from Family Values at Work and we've yeah. been working for the past 18 years on um, changing the, the conversation around care, specifically um, trying to promote paid leave uh, and paid sick days policies around the US. Got it. So yeah, so work I know well. So, you know, good news is my former organization is, has been doing, uh, Opportunity Agenda has been doing a bunch of, of uh, opinion research so that, you know, hopefully you can glom onto. But I think just to answer your question, you could pick, you know, three places where you're working with audiences and just do you know, a set of informal uh, you know, focus groups over you know, the course of a year or of 18 months, right? And you know, asking the same questions and recording them in the same kind of way. Uh, you know, we now have Zoom, so we're, we're Zoom ready. So, um, and then you know, get a sense of, did people answer those questions differently over time? You know, give people some options, like on a you know, scale of one to five. Uh, you know, how, how much opposition are you finding or how, you know, how much openness are you finding? Um, you know, capture that and also, you know, obviously keep track as I know you do of progress that's measured in other ways, right? Did, you know, let's look at legislative discussions, right? Uh, you know, did the language of what was introduced, even if it didn't pass, better reflect the story that you all wanna tell the audiences that you're trying to reach. Um, in my experience, funders and also you know, board members for that matter, 
uh, and others, you know, you know, will be responsive to that. I think you also want to be realistic about your own time frame, right? So, is this something that we think we can do in a grant period, or are there certain th- benchmarks that we believe we can hit, especially in some places, over the course of an eighteen-month grant? Um, but actually, our goal is is five years. Um, you know, I think being realistic with donors about that is important and recognizing you're gonna to have to remind them, right? Because they have their own stakeholders, right? Your program officer has got to explain uh, to the people above them, why, you know, why should I make another grant for a uh, paid family or medical leave when, you know, we haven't seen the progress that we, you know, were hoping for. Um, so, you know, kind of reminding stakeholders of that longer time frame, I think is important. And over time, you might be able to shorten or you might have to extend that that timeline. I hope that's helpful. Uh, Alyssa. Uh, hi, thanks, Alan. Uh, my name's Alyssa. I work with High Country News. We're a nonprofit media organization, and we've just uh, are in the middle of a number of changes, including broadening, uh, intentionally broadening our audience. And um, so this is a really exciting conversation. Thank you for hosting it. Um, I have a thousand questions, but I'll just stick to a couple. Um, uh, We're also, I'm driving uh, as a fundraiser with the organization, I'm driving um, some meetings to really evaluate our metrics. And um, my question for you is how often would you recommend we collect data Mm. and, In nonprofits, I think we're always uh, struggling with wearing too many hats. So how do you share this load and who who is the person responsible for data collection and assessment? Those are my two questions. Yeah. So a a couple of thoughts and then, but you you might, I might ask you a follow-up question. So, you know, part of it is developing a culture of uh, collecting information right, which is, you know, when you onboard people, making clear there's a part of your job, you know, in staff meetings, you know, devoting maybe one out of every three staff meetings to uh, the report back. Typically, you know, almost all program staff are going to need to have, I mean, this, this is not just a narrative, you know, issue, right, this is a, a evaluation and, and data issue. Typically, almost all staff are going to have to have some responsibilities there. Um, but in my experience, we had to designate someone to be the nagger in chief, right? So it wasn't that that person was responsible for collecting all the data. We had a we had a database. It was just an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but there was somebody whose responsibility it was, uh, you know, to before the every third staff meeting to reach out and say, "Hey, Julie, I know you did a, a training." last week, uh, you know, can you, um, can you enter the data, right? Um, and it needs to be somebody with enough juice in the organization or someone who works for someone with enough power so that people are responsive, right? So if you have an intern nagging people, uh, you know, it's going to be lower priority than if somebody, you know, who either works for, uh, you know, the, the boss or uh, you know, has a, a position of authority. So I, I think that part is important. And then, sorry, remind me of the first part of your question. How often do you collect? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it really, it really depends on what you're measuring. So for example, um, you know, we would look every month at our own internal web, you know, and online data. So, you know, Google Analytics, uh, you know, we would be looking at, for example, hey, we sent out this, you know, e-blast, this, this uh, email message, and we would do uh, A-B testing, right? So we would send out a message with two different types of language, and then we'd look at, you know, wh- did people click and open one of them more than the other? We would look at that every month, but that's because that was continually available data to us, right? Something like, you know, uh, polling or assessing, <clears throat> excuse me, assessing polling of our core audiences, we would, uh, you know, have to do, you know, maybe semi-annually, or sometimes we'd only do it when we could raise the money to to do it. So it it really needs to be kind of keyed to your ability. And then, you know, the final point is, of course, what's your theory of change, right? And how, what frequency of assessment 
fits with the theory of change that you have. If, you know, if you're trying to change some, uh, you know, uh, the perceptions of, of the death penalty over decades, you don't need to be checking every week to see if attitudes have changed, right? But you, need, you do need to be checking, you know, every year. Uh, so it's a matter of kind of the retrofit there. Hopefully that's helpful. Okay, any other questions? If not, I'm gonna have you, you all try something out. Hi, um, yes. hello everyone. Um, sorry, um, no I, I have a question, uh, but I arrived to the webinar very late, so maybe you have already explained. So if you have, just ignore my question. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, but uh, one of the things that, well, uh, first of all, I work um, for AWID, which is the Association for uh, uh, Women's Rights in Development. Mm -hmm. And um, part of you know our work is also uh, on work online through our website and our social media. And we also do, you know, um, we try to do movement support type of work also through, as I said, uh, social media. One of the big questions that we have is, you know, beyond know, you know, how many likes, how many followers we have, how do we get a better sense of who is uh, among our followers and mm. how you know our messages get you know beyond those followers the impact that they are, they are having as i said you probably already talked about this at the beginning sorry <laughs> i missed the initial part but um... no no problem so and, and i have not addressed that specific uh question so you know online that's the easiest space in which to do that <clears throat> excuse me because you can you know you you have the information to contact those people and so you know you can do an online survey I, you know you don't want to do it too often but you can do a survey of your members and followers you'll get a percentage of those people you're not going to get them all um, but uh, you know you want to get a sense of whether you feel like it's a representative uh, response and you know you make it anonymous um, ask people the kinds of questions that you want to know about, right? So are you an, an advocate, uh, you know, an organizer or researcher or someone else? Are, you know, how old are you? You know, what part of the, the region do you live in? All that stuff. You know, one approach is to do an incentive. So, uh, you know, we used to, I think we gave away an iPhone one time, like the new iPhone, uh, you know, that was coming out. We did, you know, it was often technology, you know, new technologies. So, you know, that was, I don't know, $500, $1,000, which is, you know, meaningful, but to get as an incentive to get back really important, rich data, it wasn't huge. And it was also fun. And then, you know, when someone won, we, you know, put their picture on our website, all that stuff, right? So <clears throat> that's easier, but, you know, there are other uh, ways of doing it, which is, you know, you can just literally pass, you know, if you do a physical gathering, once we're able to do that again, you know, pass around, uh, you know, a sign up sheet. And if people want to be anonymous, uh, you know, just ask them, well, please answer these three questions kind of thing. Um, so, you know, th those are all things that you can do. And in our experience, people are willing to do that. Um, you have to make your own decision about whether people need the safety of, uh, anonymity and also what their trust level is with you. So when you reach out, when you as an organization reach out to them, are they going to know you and say, oh, right, you know, I, I've, I've been engaged with them and I'm happy to fill out this uh, form. Uh, you know, we, by, by giving away the iPhone, we encourage people, even if we reached them, but they didn't know who we were, some of them said that. You know, like, I, I don't, you know, I guess I get your newsletter, but I don't really know you as an organization. That was helpful to us as well. Okay, any other questions? So what I'm gonna ask you all to do is to take a moment, take out whatever you write with. I still use a pen, I know that's old school. Um, and thinking about your own um, narrative uh, uh, measurement and assessment needs. I want you to write down as many of these things that I'm about to tell you as you can. Think about what might be um, a, an activity metric, right? One thing that you could measure over a specific period of time uh, that is an activity, you know, a narrative change activity that you could report back internally or externally. Um, a reach metric, 
remember reach is about did you uh, reach the audience you were seeking? Was it the right audience and in what numbers? Um, an engagement metric, which remember is what did people do in response to receiving your narrative uh, or message and an impact uh, metric. So I am gonna ask for volunteers uh, to uh, raise your hand and share, just, just share with us one of your uh, one of the metrics you came up with. Hi, my name is Nanada Masuchema. I'm based in Accra, Ghana. I also work for um, AWID. Yes. Um, so one of my projects for this year is to organize a festival, a feminist realities festival. Mm -hmm. And so one metric I came up with as an activity metric is to co-organize selected sections, selected sessions with at least eight partners who represent particular priority constituencies. Great. So that's that's really specific. Um, it's measurable. You know when the the festival is happening, right? So you you have a, a defined time period. Uh, and so I'm I'm going to put you on the spot a little, Nana. Uh, if you were to kind of follow that through, are there um, in, engagement or uh, impact? metrics that you might uh, think about including? Absolutely. Um, one of our broader goals is to increase our membership from particular constituencies. Mm -hmm. And so for me, an engagement, an engagement metric will be recruiting into our membership, you know, X number of people from those priority constituencies. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So, you know, a number of folks mentioned uh, on the front end, you know, wanting to grow constituencies or to reach more youth or the like. And so I think, uh, Nana, you give us a great example. The more specific we can be about, uh, you know, who we're prioritizing, the more easily it can be measured. That doesn't mean we're ignoring everyone else, right? So if your membership grows exponentially, but it's not uh, you know, uh, primarily from those target groups, that doesn't mean you haven't accomplished something that is, uh, you know, amazing and also worth measuring and reporting, but it, it doesn't speak to that particular metric that you identified, that level of specificity. So from a learning standpoint, you can then reassess like, wow, we, we added a bunch of members, but we actually failed to increase our membership with these particular groups. What do we need to do differently to achieve that? So, Thank you very much. That's a great example. Uh, let's hear from, from someone else uh, outside the US in a country other than the United States. Alan, while we're waiting for that, Alyssa yeah. Pinkerton has a question about uh, more examples of activity metrics and not being particularly clear on what those might be. Got it. So uh, activity metrics tend to be closest to what you are you know, telling, you're agreeing as a staff and telling your stakeholders you're going to accomplish uh, in terms of narrative change. So it might be, uh, you know, so for, for uh, let's take Nana's example, um, we're, you know, over two, year, uh, two years, we're going to have three festivals uh, in which we'll do, you know, uh, you know three sessions a piece uh, convening groups from, you know, from this community. Right, so those numbers are, uh, you know, the the activity metrics. So then you get to measure: Did you actually do it? Did you did you have the the six festivals that you said you were going to have? So that's an example. Another example of activity metrics would be, uh, you know, we're going to give ten interviews with journalists who uh, reach the audience that we want to reach. So you're able to determine: Did I? You know, did, did we as an organization do those 10 interviews or did we do 20? Or if we only did three, what, what was the reason? What can we learn from our inability to reach them or from the fact that, you know, uh, only regional uh, news outlets wanted to speak with us, but we were hoping to speak with national news outlets. Um, the, you know, that, that also is important. So hopefully that helps. Okay. All right, well, um, I'm gonna lift my geographic restrictions. Let's hear uh, from uh, anyone who uh, can share uh, a metric with us. Hi, first off, I, I'm a, I am HR, so 
work with me on this. The fact that communications is, is slightly foreign to me. So I'm going to give you what I know for a fact my staff does. So we have a global digital engagement team and they look through our social media and they have uh, gauge methods to investigate uh, basically what is trending more when we send something out. If there's any material that's being put together, we use it in that capacity to find out which one is actually reaching better. We have different audiences, so we do different things. We also have, um, we do gauging at the partner level to find out which one of our materials is being used more and being downloaded more to be used by our partners. So we do that as well. Then our funders, and this is what causes, I think, the most controversy, cool. want us to quantify our data and the quality of our data is very different for the programs team as opposed to how the funders want it represented. Mm. So that is always something that we uh, struggle with because we can't really, we can show you <laughs> what we do and we can actually uh, see the effects that it has, but a funder wants you to put it into numbers, which are sometimes mm. really hard to, uh, to garner. And that I think is one of the, the biggest issues that we have. But I think, you know, just judging by the fact that they're able to do all of this data collection to find out what is really our, our niche and where do we need to go from there, to me seems that we've got this in a really good place from an outsider perspective. But uh, so that's what I can see. Yeah, well, th thank you, Sharon, for that. And also for your background, mm -hmm. uh, your Zoom background, which makes yeah. me feel like I'm in the tropics. Can I ask you just what, one yeah. follow up question? Mm -hmm. So, what you described, mm -hmm. uh, both, um, uh, you know, reach and engagement metrics mm -hmm. online, they sound like they're numbers. So, right. what is it that the funders are looking for that is hard for you all to? Well, I think it's the, the, uh, like let's say we're doing something very specific. We were told to garner information about how our VAE uh, guide is doing, the Video as Evidence program. In order to get more funding for the Video as Evidence program, we had to prove that our manuals were being used and downloaded into whatever uh, languages that we're using them for. So we can you know, get somewhat information, but keep in mind some of our partners aren't going to tell us that they're sharing the material. So it's not like, okay, 16 partners actually pulled it down, but 45 of them are using it. Got so it. that information that they have, it, they want it to the, to the T and sometimes it's very hard because some of these grassroots organizations are not up there using the, the computers and, and putting it down. Oh, by the way, I downloaded a manual. Yeah. You know, I paid X uh, $25 for it or whatever and, and didn't share it with 15 other people. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. So, yeah. you know, here, here's a thought because I bet this is something yeah. that a lot of folks are struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that um, sometimes works is to, and this is especially true when you're providing, you know, technical support or, you know, free or, or uh, you know, low cost resources is to essentially have a, a, a trust, you know, a covenant, if you will, an agreement that, you know, where people say, okay, if, if I use your materials, I agree that when you call me every six months, you know, I will make the time to explain to you. I mean, you know, optimally it would be online, but to your point, not everybody, uh, you know, has the ability to do that. I agree that someone on our staff will explain to you how we've used your materials. Right. And then you've got, you know, again, that nagger in chief, right? You have to have somebody that that reaches out to them and says, hey, we're going to call you next week mm -hmm. and ask you about this. Uh, and so please, you know, do what you need to do to, to get the materials together. Not everyone will do it, but in my experience, lots and lots of folks will do it um, because, you know, they want to contribute back. Right, in a, but in a way that is manageable for them and that's not taking them by surprise. Uh, right. So that often is a way that, um, you know, where you can get back that data. And sometimes then you get the stories that you wouldn't have gotten, right? Where people say, you know, not only did we do this, uh, use your materials for this training, but, you know, one of our members came back and said that they achieved this huge success, right. uh, you know, using your materials. And that's something, you know, that you need to capture as well. And we'll often, we used to often say to people, okay, hey, could we call you back to yeah. talk a little bit more about this? Um, you know, when we go to write our proposal or our, or our grant report kind of thing. Um, so, you know, it's work. I don't mean to suggest that it, it doesn't require effort, but 
uh, those those are uh, approaches that are are achievable. So thank you. I appreciate you, that. I'll Sharon. give it back to them. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm out of time. Alan, I'm going to have you answer one last question sure. and sure. then we'll close it down. So Oni yeah. has asked, what is the best way to measure reach and impact when we use broadcast media? Mm, yeah, that's great. So um, in terms of reach, uh, data on broadcast media reach is available. So uh, sometimes you have to dig, but uh, you know, for instance, I, I showed that slide uh, in India. That was newspaper reach. Uh, those numbers get reported in the in the uh, uh, entertainment industry, and sometimes you can find them for free. Sometimes there is a usually reasonable cost to see what viewership was and also what uh, online reach was, right? Because any broadcast report typically also has an online component. Um, and that information is available. You will not necessarily be able to say my interview on this news outlet reached this number of people, but you can say, you know, I did an interview in prime time or in, you know, in the, the, the lunchtime hour um, with this news outlet. And here's what this news outlets um, numbers were, their, their uh, reach and ratings with different demographics were. So that part is a little easier. It takes some digging. Sometimes um, they will make that available to advertisers because if you're placing an ad, you want to know who you're reaching. And so um, that part uh, can, be, can be done. The, the impact part is very difficult for all the reasons we described, but you know, part of it is looking before, during, and after a media interview, was there more attention towards us? Did people, uh, more people like us on Facebook or sign up, uh, you know, in our, um, on our uh, webpage uh, or add themselves to our database? Did I get additional calls from reporters or from advocates? Did that legislator who would not meet with me uh, you know, for, uh, for years, suddenly they were willing to take my call. Um, and, you know, you're, you may not be able to say with certainty that that was because of your interview, but, you know, th those of us who've done mainstream media interviews, you often feel the difference uh, afterwards. And so the, the challenge from an evaluation standpoint is to actually capture that difference in specifics. Like, oh, you want to meet with me now? Okay. Uh, I, you know, you didn't last week, so I assume you're not telling them that, but you're writing this down, right? I assume that that's because of this media interview. So um, those tend to be the ways to, uh, to measure uh, mainstream media or broadcast media uh, impact. All right, I'm going to stop there. Thank you all so much. Uh, and Malika, I'll turn it back to you. I'm going to read you a message from Sharon that says, thank you for an amazing presentation. Alan, you are very engaging. Wish my professors were more like you. <laughs> I think that's a great way for us to close out uh, this great presentation on evaluating narrative strategy. Uh, so grateful to you for joining us again. Mm -hmm.